In fifth grade, I learned in science class that diamond can cut glass. To my 10-year-old brain, this was fascinating. You see, until then, diamond to me was just a shiny gemstone, and glass was something that breaks easily. This new information intrigued me. A light bulb went off in my head, and I decided to test this out. <laughs> With the only one source of diamond I knew of, my mother's earring. <laughs> yeah. Even at that age, I knew that a diamond earring was valuable, and my mom was not going to give it to me for my experiment. <laughs> so one afternoon, I took one of her earrings, quietly went to my room with a piece of window glass, and tried to cut the glass with it. Well, nothing happened. I was very disappointed, but also terrified, thinking I'd ruin my mom's precious earring. I quietly put it back, and luckily for me, no one noticed. <laughs> yeah. I later learned that a diamond earring flanked by metal wasn't the most efficient cutting tool. <laughs> Fast forward, years later, my diamond and glass experiment serendipitously coincided with my scientific career. I'm a physicist, a condensed matter physicist. Condensed matter physics deals with complex collective interactions of atoms leading to exotic material properties. My research focuses on self-organizations of atoms and molecules at the nanoscale. A nanometer is so tiny, you can fit a million nanometers within the thickness of a dime. I'm particularly interested in materials where the self-organization has an embedded randomness. They don't have an ordered structure. Why is understanding this atomic organization important? Atomic structure plays a vital role in if a material is hard like diamond, squishy like a gel, stretchy like a rubber band, brittle like glass, or how it transports heat, light, electricity, and so on. Even DNA, the molecule of life, replicates and multiplies because of its special molecular structure. If there is a flaw, a misstep in forming the structure, its replication and transfer of genetic information will not happen correctly. So you see, there's a connection, a correlation between atomic structure and a material's function. If we can unravel the rules, crack the code by which atoms self-organize, how, find out how atoms and atomic structure correlate with the material's function, we can use these rules to create new smart materials with specific properties and functions. One of the most fascinating materials I've been studying has been around for 380 million years. I'm talking about spider silks. Spider silks are remarkably strong. A single spider silk fiber is 20 times thinner than a single strand of human hair, and yet stronger than steel. Spider silks are also highly elastic. They can stretch to several times their length before snapping. This combination of high strength and elasticity in such a lightweight material makes spider silk exceptional. Spiders spin silk to build their webs, catch prey, protect their eggs, and escape predators. There are about 40,000 species of spiders, and all of them spin silk. Most spiders make up to six different kinds of silk and a glue. This zip line, stretching 25 meters across this river, is made of spider silk. The spider builds giant webs on the zip line to catch its prey. We even came across this intact spider web in the path of a 10-meter waterfall. Spider silks 
are protein fibers. They're made from the same kinds of proteins and amino acids found in our bodies. They're non-toxic, eco-friendly, and biocompatible. They are very lightweight and resilient to a wide range of environmental conditions, including intense radiation, as we recently discovered in our research. We now get a sense of how strong and versatile spider silk is. This has been noticed in the past, too. Australian aborigines used them as fishing lines. Greeks used cobwebs on their wounds to stop bleeding, just like a modern Band-Aid. Their ability to withstand recoil without breaking made them invaluable as crossbows for guns in World Wars I and II. And my personal favorite, even tiny hummingbirds recognize the versatility of spider silks. They use the silks to line the interior of their nests and to anchor the nest to the tree branch. The high tensile strength of the spider silk gives the nest its stiffness, while its stretchiness enables the nest to expand as the chicks grow in size. Pretty nifty, right? <laughs> spider silks are now being explored for products like high-performance athletic wear and shoes, parachutes, seat belts, and protective body armor. They are excellent for medical applications. They don't cause an immune response or inflammation and can potentially be used as tendon and ligament replacements, skin replacements for surgical sutures, nerve repair, and for tissue scaffolds. Here's a fun fact. Spiders sometimes eat their own webs. It's all protein. Why waste it, right? <laughs> Reuse and recycle can't get any better. <laughs> so how can we get our hands on large quantities of spider silks for these products? Spiders make a very limited amount of silk at a time. Can we get lots of spiders to make them for us and harvest the silks? Unfortunately, this is not possible. <laughs> spiders are highly territorial and cannibalistic in confinement. <laughs> They'll end up eating each other when put together. <laughs> A spider farm will therefore not work. <laughs> I can sense the relief in the room. <laughs> <laughs> the alternative is biomimetics. Making synthetic spider silks by mimicking and learning from nature. Bioengineering labs have been successful in doing just that, making synthetic spider silks by replicating the molecular recipe and the process which goes into making natural spider silks. However, when these silks were tested for their material properties, they weren't as strong or elastic as the natural spider silks. This was very puzzling. Why did the synthetic spider silk underperform? This was my entry point into the world of spiders and their silks. I was a physicist at Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago. My group specialized in materials which have a disorder in their nanoscale structure. We were interested in understanding how this disorder impacts material properties. Glasses in general, including the ones on our phone screens, and a large number of natural materials have some kind of a disorder in their structure. Natural spider silks fall within this class. They are partially ordered. So as I mentioned earlier, structure plays a vital role in defining a material's function. If the synthetic spider silk was underperforming, perhaps its nanoscale structure could give us clues as to why. So how do we look at nanoscale structure? If I can shrink myself, like in the movie Fantastic Voyage, walk through the world of atoms and molecules inside a spider silk fiber, I'll be able to get an idea of the molecular lay of the land, the atomic landscape of the spider silk fiber. Since I don't have such superpowers, I use high-energy X-rays 
from synchrotron particle accelerators as my probes. They have the right dimensions for this job. This is the synchrotron ring at Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago. Electrons travel at close to the speed of light within the ring. When such fast-moving electrons are accelerated, they produce synchrotron radiation. A form of electromagnetic radiation, in this case, powerful X-rays. The experiment works like this. X-rays come in from this direction, collide with the spider silk fibers in its path. During this X-ray silk collision, the X-ray photons interact with the atoms and molecules of the spider silk fiber, and there is an exchange of information. After collision, the X-rays are scattered in all directions and captured at the detector on the other end. The scattered X-rays contain information about the atoms and molecules they collided with and leave a fingerprint of the stuck silk on the detector. By analyzing this fingerprint, we can reconstruct the nanoscale structure of the silk fiber atom by atom. Here are two X-ray scattering patterns of spider silks. These are nanoscale structures as seen by X-ray eyes. One is a natural spider silk, and the other, the synthetic silk made by mimicking the natural silk. As we can see, these patterns look very different. We were surprised. Even before we performed any complex analysis, differences in features in these patterns gave us clues as to why the synthetic silk was underperforming. Spider silks have a very interesting and complex architecture of nested structures. These are smaller structures within larger structures connected with each other. This type of architecture is called hierarchical structuring. A clever design tactic evolved in natural materials to function efficiently. So let's take a look at what this hierarchical structuring is and what it does. So it all starts with a thick protein soup in the spider's belly, where chains of protein molecules are floating around. When the spider starts spinning its silk, this thick protein liquid is pushed to go through a very thin duct. It's showtime. <laughs> Freely floating protein molecules have to find their right companions and self-organize. Some form very tiny nanocrystals, others a flexible wiggly net, and build layers of the hierarchy to form the entire fiber. All this structural assembly takes less than 30 seconds. For the spider, it's a matter of survival. A key takeaway is that at every level of hierarchy, the structures have a unique function. Substructures connect with each other in such a way that combine and integrate their specific roles to create an extraordinarily strong fiber, which would otherwise not be possible in such materials made of very light elements and very weak chemical bonds. In contrast, most human-made materials which are strong require heavy elements and very complex fabrication, a very resource-intensive process. At the nanoscale, the tiny nanocrystals gives the fiber its strength, and the bendy loose chains gives the silk its elasticity. Dimensions of the substructures and the directions they point to are very critical to the strength of the fiber. So, Back to our problem of underperformance of synthetic spider silks. Our research revealed that the synthetic silks were mechanically weaker because its nanoscale structure did not replicate correctly, even though the chemical ingredients did. There were misses in initial attempts at biomimicry. For the mimicry to work well, we had to understand the natural spider silks and this process more thoroughly. Since then, we've been studying several different kinds of natural spider silks with synch synchrotron X-rays. We are just beginning to scratch the surface of the capabilities of this amazing biomaterial. 
now that we understand the rules, we are not limited to just replication of natural spider silks. We can create new smart materials for healthcare and technology by designing and tuning substructures in this hierarchical layout. So the next time you see a spider's web, I hope you'll appreciate the beauty and complexity of the molecular world which make these awe-inspiring silks. Marvel at nature's optimization of this 380 million year old process that has led spiders to perfecting their silk factories. For me, it was curiosity and joint discovery that transported me from that 10-year-old girl dabbling with experiments at home to a physicist exploring the nano world. Thank you.